Pandit ji, uh, first of all, namaste. My pranams to everything that you're doing. And it's again a great honor to have you on our channel. Pranam ji, Jai Shri Ram, Namaskar ji, and uh, Om Guru Bhyo Namaha. It's a pleasure to be speaking to you on this issue. I think we, who are based here in the United Kingdom, we have some um, special perspectives and understandings which uh, I think would be wonderful to be shared more widely. So, good choice, great subject, very happy to be here speaking with you, Sharanji. Thank you, Panditji. Uh, thank you so much. First of all, let me begin by asking you this. London has always maintained that they support human rights and that it's a part of British values that they represent, right? Before we go into party-specific politics, Panditji, for our audience who may not be aware, but may be similar with the pattern that has repeated time and again, why do we see a lot of pro-Kashmir and pro-Khalistani movements regularly out of London? Mm. It's a, a good place to start. The British values idea is one which I don't think it's ever been under quite so much scrutiny. And I think the more people scrutinise the history of this island, the more people scrutinise the reality of its actions and its choices, the more people are beginning to question, whoa, hang on a moment, are British values nothing more than a smokescreen? As they've been publicised, remember Britain is the country that held the illegal war. It led the illegal war against Iraq and Tony Blair has only just been granted a knighthood. And so if British values were exactly what British politicians present them to be, that would never have happened. And so there are very, very serious questions to be asked there. But I think once you dig a little bit deeper into the history of Bharat and Britain, it begins to reveal itself in a slightly different manner. I think everybody should accept that although the colonialists left India, it was under duress. It wasn't, OK, now that we've educated you all and now that you can run on your own, we're going to go back and watch you from a distance and support you as best as we can. And let's develop this wonderful Indo-British relationship. This is the story. The reality is markedly different. When the British left, they ceded divide and rule lines of friction across the country. The creation of Pakistan East and West was nothing other than divide and rule and the, shall we say, the gift of a huge proportion of uh, Akhand Bharat to an ideology which the indigenous people of Bharat had been fighting for 11-1200 years. That doesn't really sort of um, coexist with the idea of a, a nurturing, benevolent British value um, system. Uh, the other thing that they left was the Khalistan movement. Uh, you know, Khalistan, the SGPC, the Shiromani Gurdwara Prabandha Committee, was actually something that was originally conceived of by the British as a way of grasping all of the various religious institutions, the Gurdwara, many of them were in the hands of Mahanths at the time, and giving them over to a group of their own choosing. It's noteworthy that um, the British actually formed the very first committee and then a few days before the uh, Punjabis and the Sikhs got together and said no, no, we're going to do our own and they created one with 175 members and tried to, to, to incorporate uh, the British ideas as well. And so even in 1920, before partition, the British were involved in giving the seeds of a separate Khalistan or a separate Sikh identity away from the traditional dharmic identity which lies at the hearts of Sikhi. So they have their roots in our earliest um, independent status and I don't believe that they have um, discarded the divide and rule assets that they left in Bharat. It's um, also repeating the pattern because it, it, it's also a major project because decolonizing our minds has only just begun and I think it's a long way to go. But let me get back to you. Sarah, what I don't understand, uh, first of all, Namaste, it's again very good to talk to you here. Uh, what I fail to understand is how do, uh, how do the people there in the UK not see through people like Lord Nazir, who's convicted of such heinous charges, uh, he's against the very uh, peck of humanity, I mean, the, the kind of charges that have been leveled against him, 
he has even gone on to dub them as uh, malicious fiction. Mm. So first of all, uh, could you give us more details into what this campaigner for Khalistanis and Kashmiris uh, is all about? Namaskar Jashi Ram and welcome to all of our listeners and guests today. What I would say about what Panditji has just raised about the Khalistani efforts and Kashmiri separatist efforts, extremely disturbing. And interestingly, today um, in the UK, we've just received extremely disturbing news about a concerted legal effort from a British law firm to actually sue Amit Shah and senior representatives and jawans in India, in Indian administered Kashmir, about their behavior, apparently about their alleged terrorist activities. I was stunned, absolutely stunned, but it also indicates and makes very clear the absolute um, sheer audacity of these separatists. And they feel that they have the freedom and they have the complete space to be able to proliferate such falsehoods and lies. The piece that I was actually referring to is in the independent. Now we know where the stance of the independent is, but nonetheless, those who have constantly been fed the propaganda that India is a despotic nation and is ruling over Kashmir with an iron fist, indiscriminately killing Pakistanis and Kashmiris every which way, every single day. Those falsehoods continue to be propagated and efforts like these, which are rooted in ridiculous law and it's deemed doomed to fail, nonetheless grab all the headlines. And then we have the efforts of so-called celebrities like Riz Ahmed, Rizwan Ahmed, who is a British national, yet doesn't waste any time telling his friends in Hollywood and everyone around the world about the horrors of Kashmir and what India is doing there. So that really places and positions this scenario for us in the fact that the propaganda war is being executed with incredible skill and stamina by enemies of Bharat. And that's what we need to be careful of because the intelligentsia within the academic field and um, in the media fields, they know exactly what they're doing. And they are relentless in the pursuit of propagating this information, whether it's NBC, NPR, Guardian, Independent, and their propagandist foot soldiers, such as this law firm, constantly spew a certain narrative. And the problem is, quite frankly, that Indians do not fight back against it frequently enough. Um, in India itself, Narendra Modi ji, Amit Shah, etc., will occasionally say something about foreign interference and are strong. In this country, other than the likes of MPs such as um, Bob Blackburn, who's really going to speak for us? But it's up to us to do that. Why has it taken such traction and taken such foot? It's um, gained such speed. It's simple because they get to control the narrative. The smokescreen of this is Islamophobia as well. And that's what's most disturbing. If you say anything about what's happening about the Kashmiri Pandit's exodus and ethnocide, it's Islamophobia. If you point right. out that Laws Nadir Ahmed is a paedophile, which he is now, we know, Islamophobia. So that's a smokescreen and that's what supports this propaganda drive. Right. You're absolutely right. And thank you so much for bringing that up. Uh, Panditji, as a follow up, uh, what Sarabji also says has a lot of uh, sense. Uh, but also there are limitations as to what the Indian government can actually do because there are going to be international repercussions and you can't really uh, prosecute or persecute somebody. Uh, although there is ample evidence that they have been funding anti-India activities. But however, uh, is there any other external linkages to these people who have been funding these secessionist movements? Well, the um, firstly, Sarabji, I'd just like to pick upon a point that you raised. And today's the 19th of January, of all days. And, you know, Kashmiri Hindus, called the Kashmiri Pandits, are still in mourning. Um, the crimes that were rained down upon them were the worst crimes. They were the crimes inflicted by demons in human form. And yet they still have not had the opportunity to have their day in court. And so that's happening on the one hand. On the other hand, we have this rhetoric which is that uh, India is uh, committing atrocities against Khalistanis and Kashmiris. And the, the word play 
and the use of identity politics is something that we on the Sanatani side and Indian uh, government agencies and Indian voices have never really managed to pick apart adequately and to understand how the, the language of identity politics is leveraged against us all the time. Uh, Salabji has just touched upon how quickly uh, a, a genuine criticism of a Lord Nazir Amid it immediately lapses when it's um, rebutted with, oh, it's Islamophobia, because suddenly you're not in, in the position of looking at the subject or the issue or the facts. You're in the, the slanging match, the throwing of accusations, and that's a different ball game altogether. We do not have robust um, entities which are engaged in challenging this. Now, what we have done here in the United Kingdom is now start to be that voice that voice which says actually this is wrong. You see we've realized that the propaganda that's being peddled it has a target audience and that target audience are largely ignorant, uninformed and largely innocent and so when they are presented with what looks like a coherent plea for compassionate support from the Khalistani movement or the Kashmiri separatist movement by and large the general public buy into it unless there is a voice which says, well, actually, here's a different side to it. And so we in the UK now are beginning to pick this up and starting to run with it. And we're making discoveries left, right and centre. You've asked about other agents. I think this is a very appropriate time. We, um, in one of my uh, interviews last year, we disclosed that um, some of the Labour Party politicians were receiving funds directly from the Pakistani government. So we have a state... Um, <clears throat> an elected, democratically elected politician whose intentions are really the service of British tax-paying citizens being funded to the tune of some £30,000, I think it was, um, by Pakistan. And the Labour Party has a very pro-Pakistan, very pro-Islamist orientation agenda. Only a short while ago, a few days ago, um, the, the main news was that Barry Gardner has been in receipt of £100,000 per annum and I think it's worth recognising that that's more than the MP salary. So he's been paid by the British public to the tune of some £82,000 and then on top of that he's receiving £100,000 per annum from China and he would have us believe that that doesn't um, influence him at all. You know, the, the, the reason, the thinking about conflict of interest has just become so poor and so poor, we are so weak. It's a, an extraordinary development. There is one aspect I just want to toss in, in sure. uh, while we're talking about this, and that is that my sources tell me that Barry Gardner was the person who arranged the first conversations between Prime Minister Modi in his first term and the Chinese CCP, the Chinese government. And I'm just trying to get uh, more information about it. But if that's the case, then all of a sudden we have a senior Labour Party parliamentarian who has been a shadow minister, acting and paid for by the Chinese government, being the person arranging meetings with Xi uh, Jinping uh, and the Chinese CCP, um, supposedly for the advantage of uh, the Indian government. These should be ringing alarm bells if that was the case, and uh, one really does have to wonder what it was that Barry Gardner did which warranted him being granted a Padma Shri. Right. This is, this is extremely interesting. Uh, but Panditji, uh, no, of course, we don't have a lot of details on that, uh, so we'll mm. wait for you to confirm uh, with your sources, sources further before yeah. we comment on that. But I, I think you will agree that there is a certain part, uh, pattern to Labour Party uh, and its supporting anti-India activities. Uh, so could you please give our audience an overview as to why the Labour Party, or at least that is how it seems to us here in India. And more than anything else, I think this has to be a tip-off to the British intelligence if uh, certain sitting members of parliament in the British are receiving Chinese money more than Indians being concerned about it. I think the Brits have to take a uh, serious note of this. Yeah, the old boundaries, um, they seem to be just evaporating. You know, we have this notion of Chinese walls, um, and I use that pun intentionally. Um, there don't seem to be any Chinese walls that the Chinese have respected. 
and it would seem that uh, even the Chinese wars that have existed in traditional British politics, British politicians are no longer aware of them either. But I, I'd like to just point out a couple of things. One is that the Labour Party is a signatory to the International Socialist Pact. The Congress Party in India is a signatory to the International Socialist Pact. They are the same animal. They are connected at the highest levels. And um, David Miliband, he used to come to Amiti to actually campaign. The Labour Party used to send its senior personnel to campaign for Rahul Gandhi. Okay, it's the Labour Party which was instrumental in ensuring that Prime Minister Modi ji as he is now never left Gujarat when he was Chief Minister. The 10-year passport ban was actually something the Labour Party put in place. Right. Now, the Labour Party is quite clear about its credentials. We have seen that it's chosen to support Pakistani interests at the expense of Indian interests. And it's a tragedy that even after all of that, even after the conference resolutions condemning Bharat and making all sorts of allegations, 10,000 rapes by Indian serving personnel against Kashmiri women, all of these sorts of allegations, none of them supported by evidence, the Indian diplomatic service was still happy to engage with the Labour Party. In fact, it was my small uh, circle of colleagues and friends who informed the Indian High Commissioner that the anti-India resolution was going to be passed on the floor on the same day as the Indian High Commission was hosting a dinner for the Labour Party at the Labour Party conference. They weren't aware of it. Can you imagine how embarrassing that would have been for the High Commissioner to be hosting a dinner at the very venue where the same party had passed an anti-India resolution um, unanimously and un unchallenged? So there is a lot of work that our Indian MEA needs to be doing to recognise the writing on the wall. The Labour Party are not hiding this. They are saying this is who we are. And so it really does need to be uh, accepted by the uh, the MEA for what it is. But they do have a lot of sympathisers uh, within the left in India. I, I remember a lot of my friends from the left uh, being uh, absolutely shattered when Jeremy Corbyn uh, almost lost a bit, you know. <laughs> so one can only <laughs> imagine the distress. Uh, Saravji, uh, what the Labour Party does is hide behind um, an excuse and say that they promote British values and um, that includes human rights and which is why they get to speak on Kashmir a lot. Mm. Um, and they even recently spoke about uh, the FCRA issue with Mother Teresa's uh, charity. Yes. And uh, I believe that they said, um, they, they called for a reversion of this iniquitous decision by the Indian government. Uh, but first of all, are these British values? Do you agree with them? And secondly, if they are speaking about human rights in Kashmir, then what about the human rights in POK as well? I mean, nobody speaks mm. about that. Absolutely. So I think the Labour Party has been deliberately selective in its politics, tainting it with co alongside communal lines for the interest of vested interests and it knows where its greatest support comes from um, and any argument that is contrary to that risks upsetting the Islamists who want only one narrative to be propagated which is that India is a fascist state, that Modi is a fascist state, that the BJP and the RSS are its foot soldiers essentially and I mark this trend back to the running needs trusts uh, definition of islamophobia which was in 1997 because slowly and surely since that time this movement against Parup and any kind of strident strong hindu philosophy took ground and then once you get to 2002 that's where you see all the think tanks getting together the ngos the reports the parliamentary meetings convened um, and the narrative is just completely one way it's completely unilateral and it c c doesn't consider the um the pilgrims that were burnt in the train it just talks about the decisions that they think were made by Modi without looking deeper into it in terms of is there, are these british values what british values should um really ascend to and propagate is a sense of equanimity a sense of understanding that each community has its own requirements and needs, but ultimately they assimilate into British values. 
because if you're born in this country, you may under, you may think to yourself, what on earth are British born Sikhs doing, um, f f waving the flag for the Khalistani cause when they weren't even born in 1984? And I've met many of these people. And the only way that this is being propagated and spread is a nexus of funding of NGOs of think tanks which want to feed the same negative imagery of victimhood and the problem is that what India fails to do time and time again is to combat that narrative in an aggressive fashion and when it comes sorry go on no no please go on yeah so what I was going to say was that and the only time and it is quite telling where they have amped up all of their rhetoric and their efforts is since 2014. So that's the problem, um, that because of when Indians were quiet, when they were playing ball, when they were listening to the left-wing intelligentsia, there were no complaints, even right. except for things like Barbary Mosques and stuff like that. And then the minute Samodhi comes into the fray and, and he speaks nothing but peace, suddenly the, this powerful apparatus comes into being and it is so spread over the world um, of the west that one just it boggles the mind in the case of the guardian the independent look these organizations that are begging for money for them headlines and clickbait is vital but when you actually read the commentary there's a there's a there's a very mendacious evil tone to the language they're not interested in human rights they're talking about very specific um narratives that want to delegitimize de Bharat, any kind of Hindu thought, any kind of forthright opinion that is that propagates that we are proud of who we are. Anything that seeks right. to dismantle that gains traction. And that's why you have even today in the last two days, you have people like Ayub in the Washington Post still saying the same thing over and over again. And we don't counter that. We have outlets like OP India, etc. But you know, the West doesn't read that. So it's up to us to create more NGOs, think tanks, and to get the information out there to have more events, because unfortunately, the Khalistani movement is gaining a lot of traction here to the point where they don't even see the reality. They don't even look that it's Congress who stood by and allowed the blood to run through the streets. Modi and right. the RSS have absolutely nothing to do with it. But yeah. if we don't say anything ourselves, then these falsehoods stand. A major part of the Indian intelligence here, including the academia and the media, is not considered credible because they uh, propagate a different point of view that does not align with the West or its interests. And which is one of the reasons that there's glass ceiling uh, for a lot of our organizations, which are doing credible work with by using the same sources uh, as the BBC and Washington Post to make our arguments. Uh, but I think that is going to be for a while now. But let me get back to you. Uh, Panditji, first of all, uh, let's address the Mother Teresa issue, the Mother Teresa charity issue. Why would anybody have an issue with such a great soul who's doing so much of work and her charity is doing so much of work? I mean, um, why is this fascist Indian government cracking down upon the sisters of charity? You know, we have a world which works in a particular way and most of our Hindu family and the Indian public at large are relatively innocent in understanding how this world works. After the Pope issued that papal bull that any white Christian can go out there and just possess any land that wasn't occupied by Christians and then the Spanish and the Portuguese started to wreak havoc in every corner of the world and then the British came and started to steal from the Portuguese and the Spanish and developed their own particular version of that vision, that Christian expansionist vision. That was the dominant force, that was the blessed violence which just f flowed into every corner of the world. All of the ancient civilizations suffered as a result of it and out of that period emerged a world order a way in which things are automatically assumed to be. This is the way it is. It's a very narcissistic, Eurocentric, Christian-centric view. And, you know, you have to compliment them for their dynamism, but you also have to make a note that they, you know, there is almost something uh, um, Tyrannosaurus-like in the enthusiasm with which they rush forward to consume anything that they can't understand. So the world order as it is, 
is actually a very uncivilized, well, semi civilized, semi barbaric way of looking at human existence. And this is the world order that we're engaging and interacting with. A, a significant part of that world order was the Roman Christian Empire, and the Roman Catholic Empire. And it's still a Roman Catholic Empire masquerading as a religious institution. And all Mother Teresa was, was a person who very successfully leveraged the compassionate capacity in most of the European um, world, in terms of the general public, she managed to milk it to her advantage, whilst at the same time denigrating Bharat as being a, um, a civil, well, not a civilization, as being a, a, a nation of heathens desperately in need of enlightenment, and at the same time as doing that, she managed to collect a huge amount of money for the Vatican. Three in one, a trin an unholy trinity is what she embodied. You know, she successfully also managed to focus on increasing the suffering of brown people as they were dying. She was not there giving them succor, giving them support, giving them comfort, giving them healing. She was extending their period of suffering in the most demonic of ways. And this is the reality and the substance of what actually happened. I visited the Kolkata um, center of uh, Mother Teresa, uh, wanting to know these things firsthand, and I spent time there, and not a single penny that was raised globally for the benefit of those destitute souls was being expended on their well-being and their upkeep. So the reality is a little bit like um, <clears throat> the, the dichotomy between the reality of British values and British activities and the dichotomy between the PR of Mother Teresa and the reality of what she did are actually the same. There is a, a two-facedness there. And I think anybody who investigates Mother Teresa's real work, her alliances, her work with um, Papa Doc Duvalier and uh, the, the other tyrants around the world, will come very quickly to a conclusion that she was far from um, angelic. She was certainly um, towards the uh, demonic end of that right. particular spectrum. The last thing I would just say about her and that whole issue, the institution, the charity itself, has made a public declaration saying that they were not shut down, that they had failed to provide the appropriate documentation. And I believe that their foreign currency transactions are now back in action. And so it really does lead us to scrutinize how the House of Lords chose to leap on this opportunity and to denigrate the Modi government, Hindus in general. In fact, I recall Lord Harry's making the ridiculous remark is it because the Modi nationalist government is frightened of Hindus encountering Christianity? Yeah. And I just look yeah. at the identity politics laden into that particular statement. One of these days I shall take him to task about that. <laughs> but this is the nature of what they were saying. And, right. you know, the other thought that struck me was that one of them, Lord Alton, also made a remark about the poor in India. Mother Teresa's organizations was reaching these destitute Dalits and the poor in India. Where the Indian they, government cannot. Yeah. And how they would suffer. And the first thing that sprang to my mind was, well, return that 46 trillion that you stole from Bharat. And let's start from there. Let's go to all of these tax havens where these lords have their pennies and their ill-gotten colonialist gains um, hidden away. Let's empty those coffers and reach those poor people who are destitute because of past uh, British adventurism and past encounters with Christianity, if I can use the same identity politics that they use. And suddenly it would all change. But this is just another confirmation that um, what they speak, the posturing that they are so good at, the, um, the manner in which they rub their hands, there's a, a piety there, there is a, an appeal to compassion there. It's so skillful and it's so deceitful. I think the days of that are actually numbered now. And hopefully um, the more um, thorough vetting of what these charities are up to in India, the sources of their income, the actual impact upon social cohesion, the fabric of the Bharatiya society, all of these things should be taken into account before allowing a single penny, cent or a right. dollar to enter Bharat. And I think we will see that. At the end of the day, I think it all comes down to just follow the money trail and you'll get your answer. <laughs> so, like many things, you're right. Right. Thank you so much for that, Panditji. Uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time. So we'll, um, may I request Saurabhji for your uh, concluding remarks. First of all, we've been doing these talks uh, 
for months together, uh, months together now on various issues, and this keeps on springing up. Now, in case of America, even to a certain degree, you're talking about private media houses who have their own vested interests. Here, you will see uh, a state-funded uh, entity backed by sitting members of parliament uh, from one political party to the other which means that there is a clear continuation of a colonial policy of looking down upon former colonies and members of the Commonwealth. So both, uh, this question goes out to you both, uh, Panditji mm -hmm. and Saurabhji. How do we change the way the British look at other people uh, in, you know, from a very condescension uh, point of view to a rather respectful one? Right, I'll go first if that's okay. So what I would say is one thing that I do see, which is extremely encouraging, not just of late, but in the last few years on social media, um, because I'm for, for, for good or for better or worse, social media has become a marketplace of ideas um, where news has immediacy, where first impressions are made, where things can become trending and unfortunately they can become the narrative. However, what I have seen are more and more citizens of Bharat and NRIs who are younger than the age of 30, perhaps, constantly fighting back against these narratives. They will deep dive into these issues, offer instant rebuttals with lots and lots of information, whether it's through YouTube, whether it's through YouTube documentaries that are funded, self-funded, whether it's through Twitter, whether it's through Facebook, that there is an instant rebuttal to these false narratives. And our enemies didn't expect that. In fact, it perturbs them greatly because for far too long, they were able to simply disseminate all of these lies, all of these falsehoods without rebuttal. But now we have a generation right. which is proud of who it is, is proud to say um, that they are a member of the RSS or the BJP and they support Modi and they will not be silenced. So one of the first ways is absolutely let's keep this continuing be there to rebut these um, falsehoods. We must create more visual aids, um, which the Hindu American Foundation is doing in an amazing way. More fact sheets about what Hindu phobia is to make clear that Hindu phobia really is a thing, which is the common description of these sort of things these days, because that's one thing we need to bring more into the public sphere. But Saurabhji, I have to yeah. ask you, and I hate to interrupt, mm -hmm. you know, last time when you were here on a one-on-one -on -one conversation, I remember you telling me as soon as the new Twitter CEO took over, you said that social media is not really a safe space for Hindus because you're const mm -hmm. constantly being censured. So in that sense, I try to get what you're trying to say, that social media has enabled a global conversation in that sense, mm -hmm. we're all more connected. But do you actually think we can fight our battles on Twitter? Not alone, of course not. Um, it's just one part of the narrative war. Um, ultimately, it comes down to NGOs, it comes to think tanks, which need to be more funded. I've seen a few um, friend, you know, um, NGOs friendly to Bharat hold um, co-sponsored events with other organizations such as the Henry Jackson Society, which are also interested in fighting narratives around Islamism, Islamic thought. So we need to make those connections. We need, we need to make the connections across the globe, right for other out, for other papers and other media houses, which are interested in these issues as well, um, to get onto different platforms. And um, one of the most beautiful things I've seen in the last few weeks on YouTube, there's a wonderful documentary about the origins of the um, and the misappropriation of the swastika and how it's been used to constantly demonize right. Hinduism and call them Nazis. And yet that YouTube video is there and I've learned so much from that. And I thought I knew all about the history of the swastika. As long as these efforts are being created, podcasts, fact sheets, things like that, that's what we need to look out for and spread that information. Follow the Hindu American Foundation, for example, Look at what people like Robert Spencer are doing, talking about these issues. With regards to Twitter, it's not the safest space, but yet Arti Tuku's, uh, account was brought back, thankfully, but she had to fight that. You need deep pockets, unfortunately, to fight those narratives. So I would say there is hope, but constantly be there on the internet, be there, take charge of the narrative game. Because at the moment, if you type in Narendra Modi on Google, we, but we all know what comes up, all of the falsehoods. We need to take control of that narrative game. 
Right. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, Panditji, would you like to uh, please share some closing remarks? Yes, I think um, it's worth remembering that we do not have an option. No Hindu, no Indian has a choice anymore. We can't sit on the sidelines and say, Koi baat nahi, koi aur kar lega, right? It won't affect my home. Yes, it's going to affect everybody's home. And there are a number of reasons why. The history of the world is being rewritten. Britain has told the world that it's a great trading nation with philanthropic ideals, which is shared in every corner of the world. And the reality is that it was a pirate nation with no natural resources, which didn't trade, it actually used mafia tactics to destroy other economies. It asset stripped whole civilizations. You know the story about the weavers and their thumbs, the way in which the British government passed legislation to prevent a thriving shipping industry. Bharat had the most amazing um, merchant fleets and yet they were all destroyed by the British. So the story about British trading, about British values, all of those things, that's all being rewritten. Now just think, do you think that the British and the other colonial powers want that to be rewritten? Do you think they want their, um, the ruling classes want their general public to be aware that everything they had been told about European exceptionalism, about Christian supremacy, was all bunkum and a complete uh, bundle of lies and a fraud? No, they don't. And so as long as there are Hindus, there are Indians who are saying, we want Bharat to decolonize. We want to be able to reconnect to our civilizational trajectory, pick up from where we are, were, dust ourselves down and hold our place in the world and contribute a dharmic vision to human existence. All of those other competing um, houses, they feel threatened and they will do everything to continue holding on to the assets they stole and to keep concealing the story which justifies their hanging on to them. You know, the British Museum only hangs on to all of its artifacts because it manages to convince itself that it's doing the world a favour. And so we don't have any choice. Everybody has to do whatever they can in their own locality, in amongst their own groups, and they need to start to engage. There are a number of things, though, that need to be done at a government level. It struck me when um, I was watching that House of Lords exchange and at one point Lord Harry, the Bishop um, of the Church of England, he stood up and said, can I ask the Minister to demand in writing of the Indian government an account of what they did and why they did what they did to Mother Teresa's charity so that we can scrutinise it? And I thought this man is still living in the last millennia. Right? He still thinks that they, as the British House of Lords, can demand accountability from an Indian Minister of External Affairs in writing. This is the challenge that we're facing. And so these people, these sorts of people with these unbelievably um, outdated colonialist values and ideas, they will only stop when they're challenged. And so people like uh, Sologi, myself and others who have uh, stepped forward to do this work, we do need to be supported, even if it's by people you know, following Sorovji on Twitter, um, people contributing and participating in the practices and the, uh, the actions that we're undertaking. That support is vital. In this time, any society needs to have the capacity to defend itself. We are an inclusivist society, but there are exclusivist societies who want to see our erasure, which means we have to be able to defend ourselves. And how do we defend ourselves if not from within? The communities, the society, our Bharatiya civilization needs to rearrange itself to allocate resources to those groups and individuals who are actually doing the work of manning the boundary and defending the boundary. When that change happens, then all of a sudden we will see a decolonization of Bharat at such a phenomenal pace. And I think this year, no. next year, maybe the year after, they're the years when this has to happen. I really hope it does, um, because that's the need of the uh, uh, hour, right? I mean, if countries like China and India with such economic and military prowess can face this kind of a secondary treatment, you cannot even imagine what they'd be doing to other Asian and uh, African countries who are far... Uh, far less weaker than us. Um, so in that sense. So hopefully this attitude will change and uh, uh, it will come because of the pressure applied and the knowledge spread by individuals like you. 
Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining me today. Unfortunately, I think Rashmi is out at the moment and she won't be able to join us for the conversation. So I propose that we end this conversation here. Namaste, Jai Shri Ram. Thank you so much for joining. Jai Shri Ram. Namaste. Thank you very much. Please remember to subscribe to us and switch on the notifications for this channel. For our other social media links, more content, and to support our work, please visit citti.net. Dhanyavad. Namaskar.